David Clark worked as a 911 rescue captain. In addition to going out on calls to put out fires or deal with other emergencies, he also periodically trained and coached his crew, keeping morale high and improving all rescue skills. One day after another mission, David was going over all the mistakes in their team's work with his subordinates. Aiden, he's got a right to be upset with you. You left him in a dangerous spot and tried to be a hero. But Captain, I thought I heard someone calling for help. It was coming from outside the building. It was dark, I couldn't see anything. That's why you stay with your partner. He had no choice but to assume that something happened to you and you needed his help. You never leave your partner, especially in a fire. You give him some time and then give him an apology. And make it sincere. Yes, sir. His wife Elizabeth worked at the hospital. She had a sick mother, and she was very concerned that insurance would not cover the essential equipment she needed for her mother after her stroke, the special medical bed, the wheelchair, and the accessories she wanted to buy for her sick mother. The relationship between David and Elizabeth was becoming more and more strained. David was very busy at his extreme job, giving it a lot of energy, and when he went home he often spent his free time either at the internet screen where he searched for interesting offers related to the sale of modern motor yachts or other pleasures, which he was ashamed of, so he tried to delete all the history of visited web pages at once so his wife would not suspect anything. Lately, when they did get to be alone in their new home, their domestic relations often turned into quarrels. You have breakfast already? Yes. What did you eat? I had the last bagel and a yogurt. Are you planning on making a grocery trip soon? David, you work 24 hours and then you're off for two days. You've got more time to go than I do. I asked a simple question. You don't need to get smart with me. At least save me some breakfast. I never know when you're coming or going out. You never tell me these things. Liz, what is your problem? Did I offend you by walking in the door this morning? No, you just can't expect me to work every day and get the groceries, while you look at trash on the internet dreaming about your boat. You chose to take this job. And no one said you had to work full time. We need the income. Especially since you tuck away a third of your salary, saving for a boat we don't need. You've got $24,000 in savings when things in our house need fixing. Like what? The back door needs to be painted, the yard needs landscaping. And I want to put more shelves in the closet. Those are called preferences. Those are not needs. There's a difference. If you want to spend your money on that stuff, fine. But I've been saving for my boat for years. You're not taking that from me. This is so pointless. I don't have time for this. Said a distraught Liz and started to leave the kitchen. Yeah, shut the door on your way out. Replied David as if nothing had happened. The next day at the gym, David had a serious conversation with his friend and work partner. It ain't working, Dylan. How is it that I get respect everywhere I go except in my own house? I've been there, and it's a hard place to be. Dylan replied with compassion. What did you do about it? I realized that it wasn't my marriage that was broken. I just didn't know how to make it work. What does that mean? David asked in amazement. That treadmill's not broken. But if you don't know how to run it, it ain't gonna work for you. You saying I need counseling? Well, I think everybody needs counseling. Hey, 
Look, man, I am not about to go talk to somebody I don't even know, about something, that's none of their business. All right. Elizabeth does need to respect you. But just remember, a woman is like a rose. If you handle it right, it will bloom. If you don't, it will wither. Where'd you get that? Counseling. David looked intently at his wise friend, and friendly threw the empty plastic bottle at him, not having anything to answer. In the evening he again had a difficult conversation with his wife, clearly through the prism of his own interests. His wife bought a scented candle and lit it on the kitchen table, but David put it out unceremoniously. What are you doing? I see you left me no pizza. I just lit that candle. I like the way it smells. Well, I don't. Did you leave me any dinner at all? I assumed you were eating with Dylan. Does it not occur to you that two people in this house both need to eat? You know what? If you would communicate with me, maybe I could have something for you. David heated up like an iron, getting hotter and hotter. Why do you have to make everything so difficult? Oh, I'm making everything difficult? It seems to me I'm carrying the weight around here while you're off doing your own thing. Excuse me? I'm working to pay this mortgage, and I pay for both of the cars. Yeah, and that's all you do. I pay all of our bills with my salary. Which you agreed to do. That's fair. Do you not like this house? Do you not like your car? David, who takes care of this house? Me. Who washes all the clothes? Me. Who gets all the groceries? Me. Not to mention I'm helping my parents every weekend. I've got all this pressure on me. The only thing you do for anybody is for yourself. Let me tell you, you don't know the first thing about pressure. All right? You think I put out house fires for myself? Or rushed a car wrecks at 2 a.m. for myself? Or pull a child's body out of a lake for myself? You have no idea what I go through. David almost yelled. Yeah, but what do you do around here other than watch TV and waste time on the internet? If looking at that trash is how you get fulfilled, that's fine. But I will not compete with it. Well, I sure don't get it from you. With this hint of Liz's sexuality, David clearly got to his wife's nerves. And you won't. Because you care more about saving for your stupid boat and pleasing yourself than you ever did about me. Shut up! I'm sick of you! David shouted at the top of his lungs. You disrespectful, ungrateful, selfish woman! I'm not selfish. Liz resisted quietly. How dare you say that? You constantly nag me and you drain the life out of me. I'm tired of it. If you can't give me the respect I deserve, look at me. Then what's the point of this marriage? I want out. I just want out. Answered a weeping Elizabeth. If you want out, that's fine with me. David went out to the backyard of the house in a rage and started angrily throwing the garbage can against the wall. This caused the neighbor to be visibly perplexed. On the morning of the work day, David unwittingly overheard his friend Dylan chatting affectionately and kindly with his wife, who was visiting him at work. They seemed to be on their honeymoon. This clearly surprised him. You know what? I forgot to tell you. I got Friday off and I'll be there. Good. You know I ain't gonna let my son down. I know you won't. Hey, we still got that hot date tomorrow, 
right? Oh, so now it's a hot date? Life's too short to have any other kind. You're right. I love you, baby. I love you too. And I will see you in the morning. All right. See you later. Dylan replied with a romantic smile in anticipation of a sweet date with his wife. David shook his head in amazement. And at the hospital, in the dining room, Elizabeth's friends were vividly discussing what had happened in her family, telling her to stand up for herself and make her husband respect her. Honey, Liz, I agree with you. You gotta get out. He don't deserve you. A real man's gotta be a hero to his wife before anybody, or he ain't a real man. Echoed her other friend. Do you need a place to stay? I can't imagine living in the same house. No, I decided that I'm not the one that's leaving. He's the problem, not me. Answered Liz. That's right, girl. Stand your ground. Make him respect you. At the same time, David was discussing his family problem with his friend Dylan. It's respect. That's the issue. That's the reason our marriage is failing. She shows me no respect at all. And the saddest part about it is... He doesn't have a clue. Liz complained to her friends. He thinks our marriage has been fine for the most part, he probably thinks. Our marriage has been fine until this year. Now, all of a sudden, she goes off the deep end. Do you think this happened all of a sudden? Asked Dylan. I don't know what to think. I don't understand her. She's emotional about everything. She's easily offended and way too sensitive. I mean, he's so insensitive. Liz complained to her friends. He doesn't truly care how I feel. He doesn't listen to me. Even if I say it over and over and over again. He doesn't understand my needs. I feel like we are completely and totally incompatible. At a distance, David continued his wife's thought. She's probably whining to her friends, making me sound like a criminal. I can see them all right now, crying, having some sort of group hug. That's exactly what was happening. It's gonna be okay, sweetie. It's gonna be alright. You'll get through this. We have your back, whatever you need. So you think it's past the point of no return? I don't have a reason to return. David replied to Dylan. In the evening, while on duty, David received a call from his father, whom he told that it was over between him and his wife, that she wanted a divorce. Suddenly his team was called to a rescue mission. He stopped the call and rushed to the assignment. The team arrived on the accident scene. We have a two-vehicle accident with possible entrapment. One of the vehicles is on the train tracks. Notify the train dispatcher to stop all trains in progress. David reported on the radio. The injured young woman in the car was screaming in terror for help. The door was jammed. Her friend behind the wheel was unconscious. I'm Captain Clark from the fire department. We're here to help. Help me, please. I can't get out. Where are you hurting? My legs are hurting. Please, please help me. All right, we're gonna help you. My neck is hurting. Please don't leave me. Please don't let me die. I promise you, I am not going to leave you. I'm gonna stay right here with you. You're gonna hear a very loud noise. That just means we're getting you out faster. 
suddenly a train appeared from behind a curve. Captain, did I just hear a train? Guys, there's a train coming. Dispatcher, this is Jones Command. We have a car on the train tracks notify the train dispatcher to stop all trains in progress. Jones Command, be advised, we are currently unable to make contact with the train dispatcher. The train tried to break, but the braking distance was long. It sped toward the car with the people, which was stuck on the tracks. David quickly realized that there was no more time to cut the door open and pull the victims out, so the four of them urgently decided to try to move the car off the tracks with their own resources. It was moving slowly, but the men who had been there helped them get the car off the tracks at the very last moment. Dylan was closest to the tracks and the passing train hit him on the helmet, but he survived. He just got off with a bruise. Sitting on the ground after the rescue operation, he was thanking God for remaining alive. Are you okay? David asked him. Well, I broke my record of how close I could come to death and still live. Well, don't break it next time. I wasn't trying to break it this time. Don't tell my wife. The people in the car were rescued. At the base, Dylan was approached by a young trainee who had been with them on the mission. Hey, Lieutenant. Yeah. This kind of thing doesn't happen all the time, does it? Risking our lives? Yes. Playing chicken with a train? First time. Aren't you afraid of dying? No. Because I know where I'm going. I just don't want to get there because I got hit by a train. Their conversation was overheard by a teammate. He turned to the captain. Hey, captain, hold on for a second. You know where you're going? I'm going to my office. Said David. No. You believe in heaven and hell? I don't know. When I die, I'm going in the ground. That's where I'm staying. You know, you and Dylan both seem so sure. But one of you is wrong. It ain't me. How do you know? Hey, listen, you might not agree with Dylan, but you and I both know he's the real deal. Answered David and left. This kind of work did indeed make the rescue team think more than once about death and all that goes with it. David visited his parents. He told them how he saw things in his broken family but his mother tried to show him how Liz really needed his help. This annoyed David, it seemed to him that his mother was taking his wife's side, and he did not consider himself guilty of anything, absolutely, so he decided to talk only to his father. His father told him how, with God's help, he had managed to mend his relationship with David's mother, who knew that his parents, too, had had great family problems at one time, which also miraculously had not ended in divorce. David, the Lord did a work in us. In both of us. The Lord? You're giving credit to God? Why does that bother you? You've always believed in God. If there's a God out there, he's not interested in me and my problems. I disagree. I'd say he's very interested. Then where's he been in my life? He's been at work all around you. You just haven't realized it. You haven't exactly given him an open invitation. What is this place? The father pointed to an open space with seats and a wooden cross in the middle. Used to be a summer camp across the lake. Son, I used to be where you are right now. God didn't matter to me. But I can't say that anymore. I never understood why Jesus had to die on the cross. Dad, please. We had this conversation last month. 
I'm glad this new faith is working for you and mom, I really am. It's just, it's not for me. David, is there anything in you that wants to save your marriage? Maybe. If Elizabeth wanted to, but she doesn't. She wants divorce. Is that what you want? I want peace. But what difference does it make? She signs the papers, Dad, it's all over. Have you agreed to start the process with her? No, but I think we both understand where this is all headed. I've got plans to meet with my lawyer tomorrow. David, I want you to do something for me. I want you to hold off on the divorce for 40 days. Why? I'm gonna send you something in the mail. Something that'll take you that long to do. What is it? It's what saved our marriage. Dad, if this is a religious thing, I'd rather you didn't. Look at it as a gift from your father. Take one day at a time, then see what happens. Please, son. If for no other reason, do it for me. I'm asking as your father. Forty days? Forty days. Afterwards, he had a conversation with his friend Dylan on his work shift. Forty days? Does Elizabeth know? I'm not gonna tell her. If she wants to go ahead and file, that's up to her. Divorce is a hard thing, man. Well, if it brings peace. But, David, you want the right kind of peace. What do you mean by that? You know what that ring on your finger means? Means I'm married. Yeah. It also means you made a lifelong covenant. You putting on that ring while saying your vows. The sad part about it is when most people promise for better or worse, they really only mean for the better. Elizabeth and I were in love when we got married, but today we're two very different people, all right? It's just not working out anymore. David, Salt and Pepper are completely different. Their makeup is different, their taste and their color. But you always see them together. And when you... He glued a jar of salt and a jar of pepper together in front of David. David, when two people get married, it's for better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. I know that. But marriages aren't fireproof. Sometimes, you get burned. Fireproof doesn't mean that a fire will never come but that when it comes, you'll be able to withstand it. You didn't have to glue them. David tried to dissolve the salt and pepper that Dylan had glued together. Don't do it, David. If you pull them apart now, you'll break either one or both of them. I am not a perfect person, but better than most. And if my marriage is failing, it is not all my fault. But, David... I've seen you run into a burning building to save people you don't even know. But you're gonna let your own marriage just burn to the ground. Dylan, you are my friend. And I have allowed you to speak freely with me on this job. Don't abuse it. The next day in David's mailbox came the book, or rather the large notebook with a hard cover, promised by his father. He opened it and read the introduction. My son, this 40-day journey cannot be taken lightly. It is a challenging and often difficult process, but an incredibly fulfilling one. If you will commit to a day at a time for 40 days, the results could change your life and your marriage. Consider it a dare from others who have done it before you. Day 1. The first part of this dare is fairly simple. Although love is communicated in a number of ways, our words often reflect the condition of our heart. For the next day resolve to say nothing negative to your spouse at all. If the temptation arises, choose not to say anything. It's better to hold your tongue than to say something you'll regret. Be quick to listen, 
slow to speak and slow to get angry. James 1 verse 19 David immediately tried to apply the first lesson. He remained silent and did not start an argument when his wife refused to take his clothes to the dry cleaner, citing the fact that he had two days off. He read the notebook further. Day 2 It is difficult to demonstrate love when you feel little to no motivation. But love in its truest sense is not based on feelings, but a determination to show thoughtful actions, even when there seems to be no reward. In addition to saying nothing negative to your spouse today, do at least one unexpected gesture as an act of kindness. David decided to make his wife some coffee. I poured your coffee. I don't have time for coffee. She replied and left without thanking him. David looked after her in surprise. Elizabeth's feelings have cooled down a lot, in addition, at work she began to be courted by a young handsome doctor, which pushed her even more emotionally away from her husband. David angrily poured her coffee into the sink. Day 3 Whatever you put your time, energy and money into will become more important to you. It's hard to care for something you're not investing in. Along with refraining from any negative comments by your wife something that says you were thinking of her today. David ordered flowers and chocolate for his wife, put it on Liz's table, and added a note with kind words. When she saw it, she was unhappily tensed up, and rejected it. On the fourth day he did something he almost never did. He called his wife and asked how she was doing, if she needed anything for the morning, what to buy for her, or what he could do to help her. She was shocked, and rather alarmed than appreciative of his virtue. David neither apologized to her for all the wrong he had done, nor tried to listen humbly to what she had to say, nor apologized for the way he had hurt her as a woman, but he just did exactly as directed in his father's notebook and then reported to himself. Day 4, done, so good on me. And hid the notebook. Unfortunately, Liz didn't get the best advice from her friends when she told them about her husband's drastically strange acts of kindness in recent days. The friends interpreted things quite differently, and, alas, they seem to have some reason to be thinking so. He's trying to butter you up for a divorce. And why would he do that? Before my cousin Eleanor got a divorce her husband did the same thing. He started acting nice and sweet, next thing we know he walks away with the house and most of their money. He hasn't even talked to her since. Don't you let him deceive you, girl. When she entered the house, David was sitting at his computer, surfing the internet. When he heard his wife, he abruptly erased his browsing history and pretended he was just reading a magazine. Did you wipe the websites off so nobody would see where you've been? You know, David, you're not fooling anybody. I know what you're trying to do, buying me flowers and calling me at work. And what is that? I'm meeting with a lawyer next week, and don't you think I'm buying into this nice guy routine? What are you talking about? You're not getting one dime more than you deserve. When this divorce is final, I'm taking my share. Is that what you think I'm doing? No, I know that's what you're doing. Well, you're wrong. You never assume I would do anything worthy of respect. Anything honorable. Honorable? What were you just looking at, David? What was on that computer screen? Was that honorable? Who do you think you're fooling? Do you know why your sweet little gestures mean nothing to me? It's because that's the kind of man you've become. When you're alone, that's what you default to. And there is nothing honorable about it. Liz said sharply and walked out. David had nothing to say, 
somewhere inside he knew that she was right. But it upset him terribly that she had so misinterpreted his good deeds. In a sense, he was caught in a loop, the intimate romance he needed from his wife he could not get because she was hurt and resentful of his attitude toward her problems and needs, so he was quite tempted to fill his need with something that made his wife even more upset. Liz's heart ached for her mother's desperate need for special equipment after her stroke, while her husband was raising money for an expensive boat as if nothing had happened. Out of anger and frustration, David took a baseball bat and blew the poor garbage can away, leaving his neighbor once again puzzled. Afterwards he called his father, too, and complained to him that none of his prescriptions in the notebook were working. The father told him that the process took forty days, not four, and encouraged him not to give up, not to give in to his feelings, but with a firm decision to go on. Elizabeth, on the other hand, tearfully told her mother, who could not speak after the stroke, how degrading her husband David made her feel, and that he was not even aware of it. When did I stop being good enough for him? She wondered. David decided to continue working through the notebook. At work, however, the young doctor gradually drew closer and closer to Liz, giving the wounded woman signs of attention and courtship, which naturally drove her even farther away from her husband. So, what day are you on? Dylan asked him. Eighteen. And? And it's still difficult. Every day is me adding a new concept to the way I treat her. For example? Well, here. Day 16 was about praying for her. I kind of skipped that one. Day 17 is about listening to her. 18's about studying her again. Studying her? Yeah. Here. When a man is trying to win the heart of a woman, he studies her. He learns her likes, dislikes, habits and hobbies. But after he wins her heart and marries her he often stops learning about her. If the amount he studied her before marriage was equal to a high school degree, he should continue to learn until he gains a college degree, a master's degree and ultimately, a doctorate degree. It is a lifelong journey that draws his heart ever closer to hers. That's a pretty good concept. I never thought about it like that. So do you study your wife? Yeah, but I don't think I got my college degree on her yet. So tell me a little bit more about the studying her. I'm supposed to make her a candlelight dinner and then ask her a whole list of questions. Well, my advice is go all out. Meaning? Don't go cheap. If you don't cook, get it from a good restaurant. Take it home, use your best dishes, glasses, music, everything. Make it a memorable date. At this time, two of David's team members were arguing about romantic and marriage issues. One of them was self-confidently asserting that he would blink an eye and the beautiful hottie would be forever in his arms, while the other, taught by experience, was not so optimistic. Man, what are you talking about? You ain't had a date in a year. I'm like a fine wine. I need about 35 years to reach perfection. But the lady that gets Angus Benz, she'll get the complete package. You mean complete wreckage? No. I'm 255 pounds of pure love. All you need to make marriage work is a little bit of romance. And that comes from right here. Angus Benz pointed his finger at his heart. Man, that's easy to say when you ain't never been married. It's a lot harder than you think. One day, I'm gonna walk in with a tanned beauty on my arm. I'll show you how easy it can be. 
the only thing you'll come in with hanging from your arm is a bucket of chicken. At this time, David approached Angus and confessed. It was tomato juice. He didn't understand anything, only twisted his head. The thing is, two days earlier, in order to calm down the narcissistic Angus Benz, who was shouting to everyone what a real man he was, David and Dylan had arranged a prank. They had a contest, asking Angus to see who could drink the hot liquid chili sauce the fastest. However, instead of chili, David poured regular sauce for himself. Of course he won the bet, but Angus burned his throat when he tried to repeat the David record. This calmed him down a bit. At night, during the night shift, when the whole team was sleeping, it suddenly dawned on Angus what David meant. He jumped out of bed and shouted at the whole department. Tomato juice? Man, that's wrong! What's wrong? I drank the real stuff and he drank tomato juice? You just got that? There's some serious repercussions. Quiet. Somebody's gonna get a karate chop sandwich. Angus made some noise and calmed down. David prepared a gorgeous candle at dinner, but Liz entered the house and first walked coldly past, and then, upon her return, openly declared to David. Let me be real clear with you about something. I do not love you and went to her room. David darkened, extinguished the romantic candles, and went to call his father. He told him in desperation that everything he does means nothing to his wife. She ignores everything. He asked to see him tomorrow. They met, the father came to see him hundreds of miles away. I'd say the halfway point was the hardest for us. Dad said of his experience rebuilding a relationship with his wife, David's mother. Why? Well, it's when you determine whether your heart's in it or not. Makes you check your real motives when things get difficult. Yeah? Did Mom give you a hard time? No. I thought your mother had a pretty good attitude about it. Yeah. Well, Elizabeth's not buying any of it. Why do you think that is? Because she doesn't love me. She doesn't even like me. Dad, she's just about ignored everything I've done. Are you reading everything on each page? You mean the Bible verses at the bottom of it? No, I'm not, Dad. I told you. That is not what I need. And what do you need? I need Elizabeth to wake up to the fact that we are about to get a divorce. And I'm trying to prevent that, but I cannot do it by myself. That may be true, but I think you need more than that. Dad, if you're gonna tell me I need Jesus, please don't. I don't need a crutch to get through life. Oh, son, Jesus is much more than a crutch. He's become the most significant part of our lives. Dad, why do you keep saying that? He's the most significant part? How is that? When I realized who I was and who he was, I realized my need for him. I needed his forgiveness and salvation. See, I don't understand that. Why do I need his salvation? What, am I gonna be thrown into hell? For what? Because I got divorced? No. Because you violated his standards. What? Thou shall not kill? Dad, I help people. I am a good person. According to you. But God doesn't judge by your standards. He uses his. And what are his? Well, truth. Love. I'm honest. Faithfulness. I care about people. I am those things. Sometimes. 
But have you loved God, the one who gave you life? His standards are so high, he considers hatred to be murder, and lust to be adultery. David hesitated, remembering his hours-long search on the internet and apparently other things. But still he also wanted to justify himself, even though his father was absolutely not his accuser, but shared what had helped him so much in his life, and with what he really wanted to help his son, whom he loved so much. Dad, what about all the good I've done? Son, saving someone from a fire, which is undoubtedly good and noble, does not make you right with God. You've broken his commandments. And one day, you'll answer to him for that. Just as an example, do you think good deeds done by a man with all kinds of crimes would help him avoid justice and even an American court? Yet we are talking about the court of God. David, if I asked you why you're so frustrated with Elizabeth, what would you say? David began to pour out to his father all his dissatisfaction that despite all the good things he had done to his wife in those twenty days, washing her car, changing the oil in it, taking care of the house, she appreciated nothing, threw away the flowers, refused to have dinner, that she was stubborn, ungrateful, and so on. In fact, when I come home, she makes me feel like I'm an enemy. I'm not even welcome in my own home, Dad. That is what really ticks me off. Dad, for the last three weeks, I have bent over backwards for her. I have tried to demonstrate that I still care about this relationship. I have taken her insults and her sarcasm, but last night was it. I made dinner for her, I did everything I could to demonstrate that I care about her, and she spat in my face. She does not deserve this, Dad. I am not doing it anymore. How am I supposed to show love to somebody over and over and over who constantly rejects me? That's a good question. Son, you just asked me, how can someone show love over and over again when they're constantly rejected? David, the answer is, you can't love her that way, because you can't give her what you don't have. I couldn't truly love your mother till I understood what love really was. It's not because I get some reward out of it. I've now made a decision to love your mother whether she deserves it or not. Son, God loves you even though you don't deserve it. Even though you've rejected him. Spat in his face. God sent Jesus to die on the cross and take the punishment for your sin because he loves you. The cross was offensive to me until I came to it. But when I did, Jesus Christ changed my life. That's when I truly began to love your mom. Son, I can't settle this for you. This is between you and the Lord. But I love you too much not to tell you the truth. Can't you see that you need him? Can't you see that you need his forgiveness? His father's words touched David deeply, and he thought for a moment and answered. Yes. Will you trust him with your life? They embraced, prayed together, and stayed together for a long time. The next morning, on his next shift, David hurried to share his experiences with his friend Dylan. He told him that he began to share his faith. Well, I'm in. You're in? Yeah, I'm in. Are you saying that you want to be in? I'm saying I'm in. You're really in? Really. You can't be half in and say you're in. You gotta be all in, bro. I'm saying I'm all in. David, I can't believe it, man. Yeah. You're my brother. I'm your brother? Yeah, man. You're my brother from another mother, but now we got the same father. What? I'll explain it to you later, man. This is awesome. Does Elizabeth know? No. I don't think she'd care right now, to tell you the truth. But you're not done yet, right? No, 
I'm day 21 out of 40. But I'll be honest with you. Up to this point my heart's not been in it. That's what matters. A woman can tell when you're just going through the motions. That's absolutely right. You gotta beg God to teach you how to be a good husband. And don't just follow your heart, man, because your heart can be deceived. But you gotta lead your heart. Suddenly their rescue team received an emergency call. There was a house on fire in town. The team went on a mission. A family was standing near the scene of the fire when suddenly they realized that their young daughter was left in the burning house. The father rushed to save her, but he was run to the ground because he would have just died. David went to the burning house instead, wearing special equipment and an oxygen mask. David found the unconscious girl in one of the rooms. He took her in his arms when suddenly something exploded in the house and the entrance was blocked with burning logs. The only way out now was through the basement. David took an axe and began to break through the floor to do so, and put his oxygen mask on the girl, wrapping her in his protective clothing. Breathe. Breathe, Holly. Breathe for me. David forcefully tossed the portable radio aside so that with both hands he could make his way with the girl through the flames to the exit through the basement space. Through the radio in the corner came Dylan's screams. Captain, you gotta get out of the house. The roof is about to give. Captain, do you read me? You've gotta get out. But David didn't answer. The situation was becoming catastrophic. But at the most dangerous moment of his life, he remembered the one to whom he had recently given his life and destiny. God, get me out of here. Get us out of here. He shouted in an almost burning room. David furiously worked the axe on the hard floor in the smoky room and finally managed to penetrate the heavy floor with an axe and climbed through the hole into the space below the floor. He dragged the senseless girl with him, while burning boards fell on the floor above. Some of them began to fall into the basement space itself, because the roof crumbled from the flame. But David crawled bravely, dragging the girl toward the small hole in the wall that was visible. In the surrounding flames and smoke, he still managed to crawl to the vent. He kicked the grating of the vent in the wall and began to climb out. He started by pulling the girl first, whom his teammates helped pull out. After that, they started pulling him out, too, as he was suffocating from the smoke. The girl was saved. David ended up at the hospital where his wife worked. The doctors were helping him get treatment for his burns. Lisa came up to him and said, You look terrible. I feel terrible. You gonna be okay? He sustained some first-degree burns, but he should be fine. The specialist treating the wounds and the burn answered, and then asked Lisa. So this is your husband? Yes. Very hesitantly and embarrassed answered Lisa, as the young male doctor, Dr. Martin, with whom she was beginning to have an affair, was sitting next to her, keeping records of David's condition. Dr. Martin turned worriedly and looked at Lisa, hearing that David was her husband. You've got a hero on your hands. Answered the specialist treating the wounds. Sir, I need you to keep this arm elevated for 24 hours. She said to David. A confused Lisa left, making an excuse. David, on the other hand, took his wedding ring lying on the table to put it back on the injured assisted hand. Seeing this, Dr. Martin said, I wouldn't put that ring back on your finger until your hand has a chance to heal. 
My hand's gonna have to heal with this ring on my finger. David answered firmly and put the ring on. His face was black with soot and his arm was bandaged. Lying at home, he was talking to his father on the phone. Yeah. Today, day 23. But it was hard this morning. Yeah, the newspaper called me twice wanting an interview. Seems I'm a hero with everybody in the world except my wife. No, I'm not giving up. Thanks, Dad. After the phone call, David sat down at the computer, looking at pictures of boats, when suddenly a picture of a girl appeared on the screen, with an offer of acquaintance. David almost clicked on the pop-up window, but overcoming the temptation said to himself. David, what are you doing? Fighting the irresistible urge to click on the window that popped up with the attractive girl, David said. Why is this so hard? He sat down on the couch and decided to read the notebook his father had given him. Day 23, watch out for parasites. A parasite is anything that latches onto you or your partner and sucks the life out of your marriage. They're usually in the form of addictions like gambling, drugs, or pornography. They promise pleasure, but they grow like a disease, and consume more and more of your thoughts, time, and money. They steal away your loyalty and heart from those you love. Marriages rarely survive if parasites are present. If you love your wife, you must destroy any addiction that has your heart. If you don't, it will destroy you. Okay, Lord. No more addictions. Said David, determined to get rid of his computer, which had become his addiction. He threw away the monitor and the system unit until the time when he could only use such equipment for his own benefit and the benefit of others. Before putting them in the big trash can, David smashed them with his baseball bat. Bonnie, I don't want you talking to that guy. He is weird. Said a neighbor to his wife when he saw what David had done. Elizabeth walked into the house. She saw a discarded broken computer at the front door, and a large bouquet of roses on the table. Next to the flowers was a card addressed to her that read, I love you more. Lisa read it thoughtfully. However, she left the divorce papers she had brought on David's desk. In the morning, finding them on the table, David read them with horror to himself. He called his parents, who tried their best to support him spiritually. Lisa went to the medical equipment department to talk about the possibility of buying everything her mother needed, and suddenly learned from the manager that the special bed, stroller, and accessories so badly needed for her mother had been paid for by someone, and therefore should have been delivered to her mother already. Without listening to the manager, she left, convinced that only Dr. Martin, who was having an affair with her, could have paid for all this enormous sum. She visited her parents and was delighted to find that the equipment was already installed in their home. At the hospital, she approached Dr. Martin and began to thank him. Has anyone ever told you that you're wonderful? Maybe, but not today. Antony, you didn't have to do that. Do what? Giving money to help my parents. That was so thoughtful. Thank you. You're welcome. It was the least I could do. Lisa gently took his hand and said. Do you have lunch plans? I do now. Meanwhile, while cleaning the house, something Lisa wanted him to do so badly, David came across a card that said. Dear Elizabeth, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed getting to know you. I find myself thinking about you often and I look forward to seeing you every day. Antony. David quickly called the hospital to find out which doctor's name was Antony. After finding the right person, David went straight to his office. Dr. Martin? Yes? David Clark. I need a word with you, please. It's really not a good time. 
I'm about to make my rounds. I think you need to make time. This is concerning Elizabeth, my wife. All right, what can I do for you? I know what you're doing. David began harshly, strictly and very concretely. I have no intention of stepping aside as you try to steal my wife's heart. I've made some mistakes, but I still love her. So just know, I am going after her too. And since I'm married to her, I'd say I've got a head start. By the way, thanks for helping me with my hand. My ring finger's feeling a whole lot better. David squeezed his hand with the finger that had the wedding ring on it, and brought his fist right in front of the doctor's nose. The doctor was embarrassed, and immediately realized that the conversation had taken on a purely masculine character, with appropriate consequences for him from a man who could work with his hands not only during a fire. David left, and Dr. Martin pulled out a wedding ring of his own from a drawer and tried to put it on his finger, but changed his mind. One of the nurses standing outside the office witnessed David and the doctor having a male conversation, and excitedly recounted what she had heard to her friends, who were also Lisa's friends. He had his fist all knuckled in his face. Are you serious? Suddenly an agitated Lisa came up to them. What are you all talking about? Hey, Liz, how you doing, girl? I'm fine. You sure got quiet really fast. Well, that's because we decided to stop talking. Lisa wondered if they had seen Dr. Martin. Okay, well, I'll see y'all later. Lisa left, and the nurse friends jumped on the first one, who started the whole conversation. Why didn't you tell her? Because it ain't our business. But you told all of us. I don't want her to know her business is our business if it ain't our business. Lisa found her favorite doctor, but after talking to Lisa's husband, he became much cooler to her, and was in no hurry to have lunch with her. How's the good doctor today? Pretty busy, actually. Are we still on for lunch? You know, there's a few things I need to catch up on. I've gotten a little behind lately. Well, maybe we could talk later. That'd be good. All right, see you around. Elizabeth immediately sensed something was wrong, but she could not explain what had suddenly happened to the doctor who had been so passionate and ardent to her before. There was embarrassment on her face. Elizabeth had to dine alone. She was approached by an elderly nurse who had seen how Dr. Martin wooed her on more than one occasion. Receiving her permission to sit beside her, she delicately struck up a conversation with the young girl with the intention of helping her. The conversation turned to Elizabeth's choices, and the crossroads she found herself facing. Pardon me, I don't mean to pry, but does this concern relationships? It does. Elizabeth, you're so young. I would encourage you to make your choices carefully. I'm trying to. But I'm also tired of feeling empty. Hazel, it's so nice to have someone treat you like they really care about you. Forgive me, but you're talking about a certain young doctor, aren't you? I suppose it's no secret as much as he and I talk. I couldn't help but notice how you act around each other. But I also wonder how your husband would feel. My husband has had his chance. And Dr. Martin is a good man. He treats me better than my husband has treated me in years. He listens to me and makes me feel important. I haven't felt that way in a very long time. It's always good to have that, but sweetheart, if this doctor is trying to woo you while you're still married, what makes you think he won't do that with someone else? I don't want to talk about this, Hazel. We're getting a little personal. Oh, Elizabeth, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to overstep my bounds. I need to go. It's good to see you, Hazel. 
She left. The days went by. David continued to do what he had read in his father's notebook, only now not for a tick, but with the sincere intention of restoring the relationship and really bless Lisa. Elizabeth could not understand what was going on with him, seeing how the house was cleaned, the dishes were washed, and so on. To his efforts to win his wife back, David added a new weapon, forgotten to him since childhood, he began to pray fervently for Elizabeth, believing in the higher help of his new friend Jesus to restore their lost love and friendship. He still had to put out fires and go out to save others, but now he was trying just as hard to save his own home from an invisible fire. One day David saw Elizabeth lying in bed and not going to work. He politely offered to help her in any way he could. When he discovered she had a fever, he brought everything he needed to cure her. Elizabeth could not resist him, seeing his sincere care and help. She asked him, Why are you doing this? I have learned you never leave your partner. Especially in a fire. David, what's happened to you? Dad asked me if there was anything in me that wanted to save our marriage. And then he gave me something. I could let you read it. Was it this? Elizabeth pulled out from under the blanket Dad's notebook, which David used to study. How long have you known? I found it yesterday. So, what day are you on? 43. There's only 40. Who says I have to stop? David. I don't know how to process this. This is not normal for you. Welcome to the new normal. You didn't want to do this at first, did you? No. But halfway through, I realized that I did not understand what love was. And once I understood that, I wanted to do it. David, I want to believe that this is real. But I am not ready to say that I trust you again. I understand that. But whether you ever reach that point or not, I need you to understand something. I am sorry. I have been so selfish. For the past seven years, I have trampled on you with my words and with my actions. I have loved other things when I should have loved you. In the last few weeks God has given me a love for you that I had never had before. And I have asked Him to forgive me. And I am hoping, I am praying, that somehow you would be able to forgive me too. Elizabeth, I do not want to live the rest of my life without you. Elizabeth listened to David's words, and tears flowed from her eyes. I'm supposed to give those divorce papers to my lawyer next week. I just need some time to think. You can have all the time you need. A few days later, Elizabeth went back to the medical supply department to buy bedding. Hello, Mrs. Clark, how are you today? I hope your parents are doing well. That new bed and wheelchair are certainly helping. I'm so glad. Well, what can I do for you today? I just need to pick up a few linens for the hospital bed for my mom. Sure, we have some in stock. Great, that's the only thing that wasn't covered by the doctor when he purchased that bed and wheelchair. The doctor? Yes, Dr. Martin, our secret philanthropist. I don't think Dr. Martin covered those things. No, I'm sure he did. I spoke with him about it. Mrs. Clark, if I remember correctly, $24,400 was given for the bed and wheelchair, but Dr. Martin was not the main giver. What? Of the amount given, Dr. Martin gave $400. Then who gave the other? Your husband, David. He came in about two weeks ago and paid for everything. I assumed you knew. Two weeks ago? Yes, he told me not to tell anyone, but I didn't think that included you. 
The saleswoman continued to clarify the facts about the purchase made by David, but Elizabeth could no longer listen. Tears flowed from her eyes, and she quickly went home. With tears she rushed home to look for her wedding ring, which she had hidden long ago, and put it on. She began to tidy up her tear-stained face, but it was difficult. Tears continued to flow from her eyes, especially as she realized more acutely the sincerity with which her husband had treated her over the past month, and how coldly she had treated it. She decided immediately to go and visit her husband right at his workplace. Captain, can I see you for a minute? Right now? Yes, sir. Something wrong? Elizabeth is in the bay. My Elizabeth? Yes, sir. David came out of the fire department building to meet Elizabeth, who was waiting for him outside at the entrance, in her new dress and all dressed up. Elizabeth? If I haven't told you that you are a good man, you are. And if I haven't told you that I've forgiven you, I have. And if I haven't told you that I love you, I do. Something has changed in you, David. And I want what happened to you to happen to me. It can. Is it too late to ask you to grow old with me? David and Lisa threw themselves into each other's arms. For the first time in a long time. Yes said Dylan, who was watching the whole thing. Hey, what are you looking at? He said to the other crew workers who ran to the door to see what was happening to their captain. Back up. There ain't nothing to see here. Why? What's going on? Go back to your business. David's starting a fire. Why is he starting a fire? They shouted, for fire was their common professional enemy. Ain't that kind of fire. Go back to your business. David, on the other hand, continued to embrace and kiss Elizabeth. And later he led her to the very spot at the wooden cross where he and his father bowed down for the first time in years to ask forgiveness, salvation, and help from the chief fire captain, asking for help in putting out the invisible fire in his own home. Upon learning of what had happened, David's overjoyed parents came to visit. I want to thank you, Dad. The Love Dare Notebook you gave me changed my life. God changed your life. The Love Dare Notebook was just a tool he used. I've already given it to one of my firemen. Good. It's meant to be passed on. The End Thank you for watching to the end. If you like this great story, please subscribe to the channel, like and comment, and check out our other interesting stories. See you on the channel.